Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I've uh, graduated from medicine in 1984 and uh, have practiced uh, family practice for 12 years and done palliative care for about 14 years. Uh, and I wanted to um, talk about a number of issues. And I think, uh, you know, when you look at some of the statistics, we actually have a lot of research that's been done on physician assisted suicide. And people do support physician-assisted suicide, and they support it for reasons that reflect our common fears, that is, dying in pain. And I certainly know that Evelyn, your brother, went through a very difficult time, and that must have been very traumatic for you, as it is traumatic for everybody who has to watch someone suffer. And we support it for burden to others and aloneness. Um, in fact, when people do actually complete and use physician-assisted suicide, as we know from our stats in Oregon, um, the Oregon that's been legal since 1997, and the three top reasons for requesting physician-assisted suicide and the people who actually complete is no reason to live, finished with life, and intolerable suffering. So, and in fact, if you look at, uh, if they actually ask the public, because uh, uh, Evelyn mentioned that about 75% of Canadians support physician-assisted suicide, and a study here uh, that it is from the U.S., um, whether we like it or not, we're rather like them, uh, especially in our opinion polls. And uh, if you look at, if you ask people, you know, do you support physician-assisted suicide, uh, for unremitting pain. Certainly in the US, this is a study here, 66% support it. Uh, for losing functional ability, in other words, for being completely dependent upon others, 48% support that. For being a burden on the family, 36%. And views life as meaningless, 32%. So it, it's, although a lot of people can certainly understand with someone with terrible pain, uh, would want to kill themselves. In fact, what I see and what we see in statistics is that people don't actually complete physician-assisted suicide for that reason. In fact, uh, in Oregon from 1997, uh, the number of people uh, who have chosen and completed physician-assisted suicide is one-third to one-half of 1% 1 of all patients dying of cancer. And about 30% of us die of cancer. Okay, so that gives you some idea about how many people having the availability of this uh, therapy actually choose to use it. Now, I think all of us know that pain is not equal to suffering, right? And I think the, the real essence of this issue is people are suffering and how do we deal with this, right? And we know that pain does not equal suffering. For instance, uh, having a baby and having that kind of pain is not the same as having cancer. Uh, being short of breath running a race is not like being short of breath because your lungs are full of tumor, okay? We know that, right? That it takes more than the physical symptom. And uh, people do have unrelenting pain. And it grieves me terribly to hear that despite the fact that we can control pain, people are still dying with uncontrolled pain. That should not be happening. And we can actually control a lot of pain. And yet, interestingly, even people with unrelenting pain, despite all therapies, rarely request and use physician of suicide. So what is it about that? It's something about suffering. And suffering's not something that we can measure. It's not a symptom that we have a direct therapy for. But in, in my work, I see a lot of people who are able to uh, die with dignity, with peace. In a sense, they die healed, right? And, and all of us who work in this uh, see these people. And there have been studies done, you know, what is it about these people that enables them to die so beautifully, in a sense? Well, some of the characteristics they manage to develop is a capacity to find peace in the present moment. And that's an ability to say, well, I can't plan because we're all great planners, right? We can control lots in our life. I can, I can plan to go on holiday here and there. Uh, you realize when you've got a terminal illness, you can't really plan anything. So they learn to live for the moment. 
they're able to choose an attitude to adversity. In other words, they see that the way I respond to this illness is my choice. That's my choice, how I respond to it. And they have a sense of connectedness to their self, to others, to nature, and to the, and to the transcendent, the, cell, the sense of what's beyond us. Why are we here? And interestingly, they have a sense of meaning in their suffering. Now, if we try and say, you know, what is suffering? Uh, people have come up with all kinds of definitions about what is suffering. And we can say, well, you know, we're, we're not unidimensional. We're, we're body, mind, and spirit. We're a whole person. And something that threatens any part of that uh, is, is what we would find suffering. Now, um, I don't own shares in this fellow's book, but this is uh, a good book called Learning to Fall. And in this, uh, Philip Simmons, who had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, he said that suffering is like falling. We fall on our faces. We fall from grace. And as I'm experiencing the falling of tissues, which is <laughs> aging, right? But we also fall for someone. We fall in love. We fall into all kinds of interesting situations. And what do we fall from? Well, we have this carefully constructed identity of ourselves, right? Uh, and we fall from that. We, we lose our sense of, um, we get embarrassed. We, we lose our sense of being totally uh, complete all the time and ideal. We lose our sense of what it is to be young and youthful again. We look at ourselves in the mirror and see we look different. And especially when we're faced with a terminal illness, we lose that hope that we might never die. Just maybe, just maybe, right? Even though intellectually we all know we will die. So what do we fall into? I mean, if you're falling into terrible pain, that's you fall into terrible terror, you fall into humility, realizing you're not what you thought you were. But you can also, when you fall in love, fall into joy, fall into passion, fall into the realization of forces greater than us. And what I mean by this is, you, undoubtedly, you may have met some people who say, you know, cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, it, bizarre as it sounds, I've had a lot of people say that. They said, it made me realize what was important in my life. Um, so, th so somehow they found some meaning in this. So can we find some meaning in our suffering? Now, this fellow writing in his book says, well, you know, part of finding the meaning in suffering is this business about falling and learning to fall with grace and that there also is meaning in how we fall. You know, how do we do this? And finding meaning in suffering gives meaning to our life. And there are a number of things that give meaning to our life. Things created and accomplished, things left as a legacy, that which we believe, and those people and things and the animals that we love. And that gives meaning to our lives. Now, I think uh, palliative care has much work to be done and much to be learned, we all need to learn about helping each other to find meaning in suffering because there's not one of us here who, who has lived, who hasn't suffered. We all have suffered, absolutely. And we need to help remove the suffering that can be removed, in other words, pain, shortness of breath, anxiety, and depression. Those things should be removed. But there are some kinds of suffering that we just can't remove. And that's the kind of aging, falling, falling from ideal, losing independence, becoming dependent on other people, uh, becoming reliant on other people, losing our role in society, all kinds of things that we suffer from when we have a terminal illness. But we need to support and nurture dignity and integrity. And we need to journey with that person to help them find meaning in this because I really believe that people can die healed. Now, to me, to agree to physician-assisted suicide for a person whose life has no meaning or who has intolerable suffering, which is why most people do it, 
is to completely ignore the dignity and integrity of, all, of that person, of all that they have been and all that they still can become. To me, it's like seeing someone floundering in deep water without a life jacket and throwing them a heavy weight. I really think what we need to do is to learn to throw each other a line of connectedness, a line that helps us find meaning and supporting each other and to help us all to actually achieve dealing with suffering, finding meaning in it, and at the end of our life to say that we are truly healed. Thank you.